my friend is like uh, professor rajesh sena who's uh, professor at konya cataract and refractive surgery services rp center in new delhi and also the treasurer of all india ophthalmology talk on corneal cross linking in thin corneas okay thank you ma'am and uh, i'll be presenting on corneal cross linking in thin corneas uh by thin cornea in cxl means that if the um if the corneal thickness is less than 400 microns uh without uh, epithelium so the reason is this that if it's less than 400 microns there is risk of uv toxicity to endothelium and that's why there are efforts to increase the distance of endothelium from the uv rays which are focused on the corneal surface and there are various methods that have been described in literature and that we very often use also and the one that the majority of the people use is the use of hypoosmolar riboflavin which was described long back i think in 2009 by farhad afezi wherein 0.1% uh, riboflavin is used uh, if, you know it is constituted in 0.9% saline instead of dextran and um, although the results are not at par with the conventional one but in a thin cornea it works well so uh, this is there are a couple of studies which have shown that the results of hypoosmolar riboflavin are reasonable but not as good as uh, conventional cross linking and uh, but of course the safety is there and uh, if the corneal thickness is uh, 330 microns or more then you can go ahead and do a hypoosmolar riboflavin uh, uh, hypoosmolar cxl then uh, uh, then came contact lens cxl the cscxl which was uh, described by susan jacob and group and uh, they used uh, uh, soaked pre soaked soft contact lens uh, over the cornea after putting riboflavin and that was a way to separate the the increase the distance of the uv rays from the endothelium and uh, they found it was quite safe uh, but the efficacy has some uh, you know question mark on it because uh, uh, there are two three things one is that you have a contact lens over it over the cornea so and there is a precorneal film uh, which uh, affects the uv irradiance so that is one issue Uh, the second issue is that there is decreased oxygen diffusion uh, through the contact lens and of course the third issue is that you the cxl works mainly in the anterior two third of cornea and uh, part of it is being uh, you know occupied by contact lens which will be discarded so uh, that is one issue so these are the three issues which have shown that uh, which have resulted you know in uh, definite uh, documentation that it has decreased efficacy in terms of conventional in comparison to conventional cross linking now as far as the precorneal film is concerned that was taken care of by use of uh, uh, refractive uh, uh, stromal lenticule the smile lenticule reported by uh, dr mypass as devan group and uh, uh, in that a uh, smile lenticule was used to place on the corneal surface after debriding the epithelium and putting riboflavin and the advantage was this that there was no pre uh precorneal film so the uv irradiance factor was taken care of and they showed good results in the three cases that they uh, reported in the year 2015 uh, but then again uh, there are issues that you know as uh, contact like this uh, cxl works mainly in the anterior third of anterior two third of cornea so uh, part of it is being discarded so that is one issue but definitely it is an option for a thin cornea where you can do uh, any other procedure then people have also used trans epithelial cxl in these cases to maintain the epithelium or they have customized removal of epithelium they have kept the epithelium in certain areas in the area which is thin but uh, again they have shown that the results that is are not as good as conventional cross linking and uh, um, uh, nowadays people uh, uh, less often do ap uh, ap on cross linking in in corneas then uh, the idea of uh, you know increasing the uh, stromal uh, thickness uh, from uh, the uh, work of uh, dr shriganesh atal that was uh, that was philly which he reported uh, based on that uh, we just thought of uh, you know using a hyperopic lenticule which is implanted intrastromally in a pocket 
So we started this study at RP Center and uh, in eyes which were thinner than 400 microns, we created an intrastomal pocket with femtosecond laser and then negative meniscus uh, lenticule implantation was done. So this is how uh, it was done. So uh, with the help of uh, femtosecond laser, a pocket was created. And uh, after creating the pocket, it was dissected. And then uh, uh, riboflavin was injected into the uh, pocket and uh, kept for a couple of minutes. And then uh, donor tissue, uh, corneal tissue, uh, was used to fashion a 200 micron stromal lenticule, which was again soaked in riboflavin. And then it was introduced into the pocket. So this is uh, how it is, it is done. And once it is introduced, it is spread well all over. And then uh, it is checked that there's no fold in the lenticule. And then of course you do cross-linking. Now we have uh, the, on day one, as you can see here, because of inflammation, the lenticule thickness is high, but uh, you know, at uh, six months follow-up, you can see the thickness of the lenticule has reduced down to 98 in the center and 135 in the periphery as we had taken a hyperopic lenticule. So uh, this was the thickness that we could see. And as you can see here, a thin cornea now has become 498. So increased tectonic strength, uh, increased thickness. And also uh, you can see the issue of interface haze can be taken care of by use of uh, more frequent uh, topical steroids. We have seen interface haze in a few cases. And uh, uh, what we noticed, noticed was in these cases, the donor tissue that was used was of higher age and plus the steroid was uh, uh, stopped earlier. So we now use steroid for a longer period. And this is a post-op six months uh, picture. You can see there's hardly any interface haze. There's, there's hardly any interface haze in this case also. And in, in earlier cases, we were using seven millimeter lenticule. Now, uh, with uh, as we uh, started uh, evaluating these cases, we found out that in larger cones, what uh, we used to see was that in the mid peripheral part, there was, uh, you know, lifting of the tissue. So we started using a larger lenticule, as you can see here in this case, a larger lenticule provides a better outcome. Now you can see a pre-op picture in this case. Uh, in, in this particular case, we have used a 8.5 millimeter lenticule. Now you can see the pre-op K1 and K2 is 53.9 and 59.2 and K max was 65.4. And now after the uh, procedure, the you know a cylinder has reduced significantly. It is 54.3 and 55 and the K max is 59.1. So it is quite a significant improvement. However, it is, uh, I would say it is still in an early stage. We have to optimize it. We have to customize it and we have to standardize it only. And then we can, uh, you know, uh, actually say that this is an answer to, you know, cross-linking answer for, uh, you know, thin corneas uh, wherein we would like to do cross-linking. Now, a very interesting and uh, amazing study has come up uh, from Parhad Hafezi's group only that is regarding adaptive fluence. And uh, they considered modifying uh, the duration uh, of uh, irradiance in, in, in eyes with thin corneas. So they kept the irradiance uh, at 3 milliwatt per centimeter square and the treatment time was modified. This is the study which was published in American Journal. and. Uh, they found out that there was no significant change in CDVA and sphere and cylinder from baseline to 12 month post-op. Mean Kmax value reduced from 58.5 to 56.4. So there, there was a flattening of uh, Kmax uh, by two adapters. And uh, uh, so based on that, they recommended that sub 400 individualized fluence CXL protocol standardizes treatment in ultra thin corneas and halted keratoconus progression with a success rate of 90% at 12 months. They said that sub 400 protocol allows for treatment of corneas as thin as 214 microns and uh, uh, their uh, protocol, uh, you know, changes time for irradiance. And for a cornea, which is 214 microns, they have used one minute, 30 seconds irradiance only. 
Now, they have reported that no eye showed signs of endothelial decompensation, but they have not assessed the endothelium. They just took the endothelial uh, corneal decompensation as an indicator of uh, no, non damage or uh, no effect in endothelium. So, these are a few fallacies in this study, and you know, it, it raises uh, questions, more questions than. Uh, you know, giving answers for these thin corneas because uh, uh, what we have uh, always considered as, uh, you know, a cornea, which is lesser than 400 microns, if you put UV rays on the surface, it may damage the endothelium. And there are a few case reports also related to that. But they say that, you know, in a short time, you can manage uh, even in 214 microns cornea, you can do a cross-linking. Then again, no endothelial, they haven't done any specular microscopy, but they have just taken corneal decompensation as an indicator. So there are various questions, there are a couple of more questions, which of course uh, can be discussed uh, in a different forum when there will be time. But uh, the point is that this is definitely an amazing article, I would say, uh, not sure whether we can absolutely rely at this point of time because the concept, it changes the concept in terms of uh, efficacy and safety of uh, uh, you know, cross-linking in thin corneas. So in conclusion, I would just like to say that the aim of CXL is not only to increase tectonic strength of the cornea, it can uh, provide some degree of flattening as well in a good percentage of cases. It delays keratoplasty and it also allows you to have a good contact lens fitting for visual rehabilitation as it reduces astigmatism. And uh, uh, we found out that with this intrastomal lenticule and CXL, uh, all these factors were taken care of. But then uh, the only factor that I'm still working on is the interface haze, uh, in which uh, you know a few cases have shown interface haze. A few uh, you know uh, have absolutely clear corneas. As I have enlarged the lenticule size from seven to eight point five, things are slightly better, definitely. Uh, I guess maybe with time, uh, all these things will, uh, you know, be more standardized and we will have better answer. Adaptive fluence, as described just on the recent article, is probably effective as shown in their study. They have used 35 eyes and they have shown that about 30 eyes have shown uh, good results, stabilization of cone for one year. Uh, but of course, uh, we can uh, debate a lot on uh, this article. So, uh, Thank you very much for your patient listening and uh, 